Good afternoon. Let's get the phone straight. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. That should be the national anthem of the United States of America. I've never been a big fan of the War of 1812, which I don't think really is that big of a deal anyway. And so what if he wrote it while he was sitting there? There's a war going on and you're sitting down writing a song. Get up and pick up a musket, you punk. All right. It's my feelings about Francis Scott Key. But that is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which really is associated with the Union effort in the fighting of the Civil War. A fantastic song, and if you want to YouTube it, go for it. But here I am hanging out in the classroom. It's a Wednesday afternoon, uh, rocking the Gonzaga sweatshirt. Go Bulldogs. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the Civil War. We're going to start with a section about the war itself and then probably do one on Reconstruction. And then there'll be another one later on the end of this whole thing, which will be about big business. So hope you're doing well, keeping well during the winter season here. Here we go. Starting out on the study guide right at the fresh top here. Hopefully your study guide doesn't look like this one. How do you know? Because there's no crease by the staple. That's bad. Bad. Creases equal movement of study guide. Movement of study guide equals good stuff. Here we go. First question asks us, which states seceded first? The states of the Deep South. The states that had the large vested interest in protecting the cotton and slave empire. That would be Mississippi, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Those are the seven states that secede prior to President Lincoln taking office in March of 1861. South Carolina was the first one to go. The government that they formed, the Confederate States of America, is a government dedicated to the same sort of principles as the American government, the Union government, but there's a couple of big changes. Number one, it's a much looser form of government. It's closer to the Articles of Confederation, hence why we often call the South the Confederacy during the war. And secondly, it also is a constitution that guarantees the right to hold slaves. So in that sense, there are two major differences in the constitution. The Crittenden Plan is a plan that is the last attempt at compromise before the war begins. The plan would have stretched the Missouri Compromise Line, the 36-degree, 30-minute line, all the way across the country to the eastern border of California. Anything south of that, any of the federal territories south of that would have been slave. Anything north of it would have been free. It also would have guaranteed a constitutional amendment assuring the right to hold slaves. President Lincoln was afraid that the line might be used as an excuse to invade countries like Mexico or Argentina or Guatemala, which are also south of the line, although they're not technically in the United States. Why was the Upper South so important to Lincoln? The Upper South contains a huge portion of the white population, a big part of the industrial society. It produces about half of the food and the storage facilities, I beg your pardon, the military hardware that the war is going to need. It's also home to most of the ironworks. And in other words, it's, it's what you have to have. If you can hold on to the Upper South, Lincoln has a war of a very industrial North against a very agrarian South, and that should be a short war. Which upper southern states did Lincoln lose? He loses Virginia. That's the big one to go with General Lee. He also loses North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Okay, those four then add to the other seven to create the 11 states that are part of the Confederacy. Track the battle for the Upper South's loyalty in each of these areas. Lincoln is absolutely willing to do whatever it takes to keep certain states. So, for instance, West Virginia. Wasn't a state prior to the Civil War, but that portion of the state, the western, northwestern clump of it, had voted not to secede. And even though the state had seceded, a lot of the people there were upset about that. Many of them did not own slaves, and so they were very different from what you might find in the rest of the Confederacy. Maryland is a state that we have to have. The national capitals in Maryland. President Lincoln cannot go to work in the enemy territory. And so Lincoln moves very quickly to issue martial law, he jails a number of people who are against uh, him and assures that they stay in jail for the remainder of the war, in essence suspending civil liberties in order to assure that the state remained loyal. Kentucky is a state that produced a lot of food and whiskey, whiskey, which was important to the Southern cause. Uh, Lincoln's very careful not to overstep his bounds in Kentucky, but once the state asks for Lincoln's help, he's happy to provide it. Compare the strategies of the North and the South in the early days of the war. Now, the North really would like a quick victory. At least Lincoln would. He would like to win this quickly, heal up the nation's wounds, bind it back together, and somehow put this uh, over us very quickly. Unfortunately, Lincoln's generals are a bunch of slow pokes, and that's not going to happen. The Southern strategy for winning the war is to hold out. 
to make the war as long as possible and to see just how willing northern society was to put up with the constant problems of the war. How long are you willing to pay taxes? How long are you willing to send us your sons and your brothers and your uncles and your fathers? How many more bodies are you willing to see in order to persist in this cause? Aspects of the war. Uh, the first one's the draft. Both sides drafted, not immediately. They waited a little while. There's plenty of fervor early on to provide enough recruits. But as soon as the war looks like a longer war, then both sides turn towards a draft. There's significant opposition to the draft in the north. Uh, that goes with the next thing on this chart, which is habeas corpus and martial law. A lot of the times in the draft riots, Lincoln's going to issue martial law to reinstitute a little bit of civility and stability into the society. On the southern side of the equation, if you had 20 slaves, you could get out of fighting the war. On both sides, you could pay your way out of the war, and that allowed for a lot of people to get out of the war who shouldn't have been getting out of it. Uh, the quick phrase was that this was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. The $300 or so it cost you to pay your way out of the war was well beyond the wages of any common person. Let's flip the page. Habeas corpus and martial law, I talked about the North. The South can't do it. This is a big, essential point. Write it down. Southern government is much more loosely organized than the Northern one. That assures that people like Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, can't force the Southern states to listen to him. On issues like martial law and habeas corpus, it might have been helpful to have those, but the Southern Constitution does not grant those sort of large powers to the president. It grants them to the states, and that limits what Jefferson Davis can do. Medical volunteers and sanitary commission, another advantage for the North here. Because of the benevolent empire and the Second Great Awakening, you already had a pretty well-established circuit of volunteers of women. Uh, huge among these is Dorothea Dix, who heads the U.S. Sanitary Commission. On the other side, the South, not much going on. The book mentions uh, Southern women working in the post office. That's good. Uh, economic developments. The North takes advantage of the fact that the Southern... Uh, members and the Democrats mostly are out of the House in order to pass a whole fleet of Republican Party ideals. Uh, the whole Henry Clay American system comes back. There's a tariff raising. Uh, we're also going to approve of a national banking system. We're going to put together internal improvements like a transcontinental railroad. Don't forget the Homestead Act of 1862, which gave 160 acres of land to anyone who would settle it in the West. That's a big Jeffersonian idea. On the southern side, the southern states didn't want to give their money to the federal government. So they did a lot of public buildings in their own states, but they wouldn't give money to federal building projects. Bizarre. Paying for the war. We'll start with the south. The south tried early on to pay for it with bonds and also with loans. But once it became less of a, a winning cause, past 1863, the south had no other option than to print money. The individual states in the south also printed money. And so you had a very inflated currency. On the northern side, they tried it the responsible way. Uh, they got loans, they sold bonds, and eventually they did print some of their money as well, but that's greenback currency, most of it backed by gold. So the northern economy was much more resilient and stronger than the south. Looking, pardon me, looking at the last few items we have here, Lincoln's rationale for using the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln believes that as president, he doesn't have the power to take the slaves from the southern states unless we use the war powers. So the slaves are, in essence, like any other war-confiscated item, like a gun or a farmhouse. Uh, they're items that, as a result of the spoils of war, Lincoln feels comfortable in taking. But in a, in a larger sense, the Emancipation Proclamation, although it doesn't technically free anybody, because it only applies to the states in, in revolt against the Union, it gives meaning to the cause. You see a lot of African Americans begin to sign up for the war. 200,000 in total are going to fight in the war. And that number alone changes the course of the war. My phone's ringing. I'm going to have to take this. We'll start the next video after that. Bye-bye.